Our fifth study in the book of Ezra brings us to Ezra chapter 8, and uh, we begin in verse 1. And Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. These are the family heads and those registered with them who came up with me from Babylon during the reign of King Artaxerxes. Now, I'm not going to read the next 13 verses because it's just a list of people. I want to skip down to verse 15 where Ezra writes, <clears throat> I assembled them, all these people, at the canal that flows toward Ahava, and we camped there three days. When I checked among the people and the priest, I found no Levites there. And no Levites is bad news for these returnees to the land of Israel. That's real bad news, especially for the priests. And that's because the Levites were the priest's assistants. They did the heavy work around the temple. They also did some of the teaching. So, <clears throat> you know, this, is, this puts the priests in a very difficult situation. And it says in verse 16, It says, So I summoned <clears throat> Eliezer, Ariel, Shemaiah, El Nathan, Jareb, El Nathan, Nathan, Zechariah, and Meshulam, who were leaders, and Joyrib, and El Nathan, who were men of learning. <clears throat> and I sent them to Edu, the leader in Kesepha. I told them that I told him what to say to Edu and his kinsmen, the temple servants in Kesepha, so they might bring attention to us for the house of our God. Well, okay, Ezra sends a message to a Jewish settlement called Kesepha. And there were some Levites in that place, and Ezra would like them to come to Jerusalem to help the priests. In verse 18, it says, Because the good hand of our God was on us, they brought us Sherebiah, a capable man from the descendants of Malai, son of Levi, the son of Israel, and Sherebah's sons and brothers, 18 men. <clears throat> well, God was kind to Ezra and company. His good hand was upon them. And so everything worked out just fine. And then down to verse 21, There by the Ahava Canal I proclaimed a fast, so that we might humble ourselves before our God and ask him for a safe journey for us and our children with all our possessions. They fasted for safety. It was a big journey ahead of these people. And fasting can be offered to God as a prayer, and it is a very powerful prayer indeed. Verse 22. <clears throat> he says, I was ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to protect us from enemies on the road, because we had told the king, the good hand of our God is on everyone who looks to him, but his great anger is against all who forsake him. They told the king, that they were trusting God for protection on their journey. So they were not going to ask for protection from the king. You know, we're trusting God to give us a safe trip, O king. Yes, sir, God can be trusted. Now how about a couple hundred soldiers to protect us? That would not be good. <clears throat> and so this was really a, a bit frightening. Actually, it was a lot frightening, this long trip, but they did not want the king to question the ability to God, of God, I should say. So they are going to trust the Lord. 23. So we fasted and petitioned our God about this, and he answered our prayer. God rewarded their faith by giving them a safe journey. 24. Then I set apart 12 of the leading priests, together with Sheribah, Hashabiah, and ten of their brothers. <clears throat> Twelve priests were chosen, 
one from each tribe in Israel. 25. And I weighed out to them the offering of silver and gold and the articles that the king, his advisors, his officials, and all Israel present there had donated for the house of our God. I weighed out to them 650 talents of silver, silver articles weighing 100 talents, 100 talents of gold, 20 bowls of gold value at, valued at 1,000 darics, and two fine articles of polished bronze as precious as gold. And the value of all this amounted to several million dollars. Verse 28, I said to them, You, as well as these articles, are consecrated to the Lord. The silver and gold are a free will offering to the Lord, the God of your fathers. The vessels and the priest were both holy. They were consecrated unto the Lord. That means they were set apart for God's use and God's use only. Christians are called to be holy people. We are called to be a holy priesthood today, the Bible says. And we are to set apart, we are to be set apart always, and in all ways, to Christ in order to please him. 29. Guard them carefully until you weigh them out in the chambers of the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, before the leading priests and Levites and the family heads of Israel. All of these holy treasures were to be delivered to the temple, and these priests and Levites were to make sure that it all got there. 30. Then the priest and Levites received the silver and gold and sacred articles that had been weighed out to be taken to the house of our God in Jerusalem. They accepted the job. And on the twelfth day of the first month, we set out from the Ahava Canal to go to Jerusalem. The hand of our God was on us, and he protected us from enemies and bandits along the way. And it was a long journey through the desert. And the desert had many groups of Bedouins who survived through robbery. And remember, these are moms and dads and children and priests. There were no soldiers protecting them. God's hand guided them, and he was a shield for them as well. 32. So we arrived in Jerusalem where we rested three days. And they needed a rest because this was a thousand-mile journey from where they left originally and it took them four months. 33. On the fourth day, in the house of our God, we weighed out the silver and gold and the sacred articles into the hands of Merimoth, son of Uriah, the priest. Eleazar, son of Phinehas, was with him. And so were the Levites, Josabad, son of Jeshua, and Noadiah, son of Benui. They transferred the wealth, notice, in front of witnesses to ensure that everyone knew that it was all handled properly. Verse 34. Verse 34 says, uh, Everything was accounted for by number and weight, and the entire weight was recorded at that time. They kept, they kept official records of the wealth, in verse 35, then the exiles who had returned from captivity sacrificed burnt offerings to the God of Israel. Twelve bulls for all Israel, ninety-six rams, seventy-seven male lambs, and a sin offering. Twelve male goats. All this was a burnt offering to the Lord. They made it to Israel safe, and they worshipped God in order to say thank you. 36. They also delivered the king's orders to the royal satraps and to the governors of Trans-Euphrates, who then gave assurance to the people and to the house of God. So the Persian, Persian officials in the Holy Land helped the returning Jews with whatever they needed. They were very good to them. And that was, of course, by order of the king of Persia, who really was on God's side and on the Israelites' side at this point. Chapter 9. After these things had been done, the leaders came to me and said, The people of Israel, including the priests and the Levites, have not kept themselves separate from the neighboring peoples with their detestable practices, like those of the Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and Amorites. The Israelites were, once again, slipping into sin. 
And it wasn't an occasional sin either. They were practicing sin like the heathens. Two, they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons and have mingled the holy race with the peoples around them. And the leaders and the officials have led the way in this unfaithfulness. Israel was supposed to be a holy nation, totally dedicated to God. But they were marrying the heathen and corrupting the race, spiritually speaking. I mean, this this issue, the issue here wasn't inter, interracial marriage. That wasn't the problem at all. The, it was a spiritual, spiritually mixed marriage. That was the problem, believers and unbelievers. That's what God prohibits. prohibits. Verse 3. When I heard this, I tore my tunic and cloak pulled hair from my head and beard, and sat down appalled. And all these actions were signs of grief and signs of righteous anger also. Ezra is almost in shock, it seems like. Verse 4. Then everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel gathered around me because of of this unfaithfulness of the exiles. And I sat there appalled until the evening sacrifice. Ezra is overwhelmed with grief as he thinks about the sin of the people and the possible wrath of God because of it. Mixed marriages are a very complicated problem to fix, too, so he's probably concerned about what he can do about this situation. Verse 5. Then at evening, at the evening sacrifice, I rose from my self-abasement with my tunic and cloak torn, and I fell on my knees with my hands spread out to the Lord my God. At first Ezra was numb, and then after he recovered from the initial shock, he prayed. Six. He says he prayed, O my God, I am too ashamed and disgraced to lift up my face to you, my God, because our sins are higher than our heads, and our guilt has reached to the heavens. Ezra was so sorry that he was even ashamed to he was even ashamed to talk to God. But he talked to God anyway. And there's a lesson there for us. <clears throat> when we are feeling too ashamed to confess our sin, we must confess our sin. Because no matter how we feel, that is what God wants us to do. Seven. From the days of our forefathers until now, our guilt has been great because of our sins. We and our kings and our priests have been subjected to the sword and captivity, to pillage and humiliation at the hand of foreign kings as it is today. The history of Israel is filled with sin and punishment and guilt and shame. Verse 8. But now, for a brief moment, The Lord our God has been gracious in leaving us a remnant and giving us a firm place in his sanctuary. And so our God gives light to our eyes and a little relief in our bondage. And for about 60 years, God has been blessing Israel after he had punished them for their many serious sins. Verse 9. Though we are slaves, our God has not deserted us in our bondage. He has shown us kindness in the sight of the kings of Persia. He has granted us new life to rebuild the house of our God and repair its ruins. And he has given us a wall of protection in Judah and Jerusalem. Israel was still a part of the Persian Empire, but God has returned the Jews to their land and he has also caused the king of Persia to be very kind to them. So, They're still under bondage, but things are going pretty well. 10. But now, O our God, what can we say after this? For we have disregarded the commands. Sin is especially grievous to the repenting child of God when they consider how good God has been to them. It makes you feel even worse about your sin, and that's why Ezra is feeling so horrible. He says, But now, O our God, What can we say after this? For we have disregarded the commands you gave through your servants, the prophets, when you said, 
The land you are entering to possess is a land polluted by the corruption of its peoples. By their detestable practices, they have filled it with their impurity from one end to the other. And the mixed marriages were bad enough, but it was even worse because it led to the Israelites committing adultery and other sins to get along with their unsaved spouses, I suppose. 12. Therefore do not give your daughters in marriage to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. Do not further their welfare or prosperity at any time that you may be strong and eat the good things of the land and leave it to your children as an everlasting inheritance. Ezra quotes Moses, who made it clear that if they wanted to be a great nation, then they also had to be a good nation. Verse 13. What has happened to us is a result of our evil deeds and our great guilt, and yet our God, or yeah, our God, you have, you have punished us less than our sins have deserved and have given us a remnant like this. Israel had been punished with a 70-year exile, but that was less than what their sins deserved. They deserved to be totally wiped out. You see, the God revealed in the Old Testament is a very merciful and a very patient God. 14. Shall we again break your commands and intermarry with the peoples who commit such detestable practices? Would you not be angry enough with us to destroy us, leaving us no remnant or survivor? Israel should have remembered the restraint the Lord had displayed when he punished them the last time, because he did not punish them as much as their sins deserved. God's goodness should have inspired them to be good, because next time he may not be so merciful. Verse 15. O Lord, God of Israel, you are righteous. We are left this day as a remnant. Here we are before you in our guilt, though because of it not one of us can stand in your presence. God is righteous, according to what Ezra says, and we know he is. God is righteous, and that means he must punish the Jews if they persist in their sin. In other words, the nation is once again on the edge of disaster because of their sin. They need to repent, and they need to repent fast. We'll pick it up in chapter 10 and finish the book of Ezra next time. Until then, so long, everyone.